If you'll turn to 2 Peter, the third chapter, Peter said, This second letter, beloved, I now write to you, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this primarily. Remember this first. Put this down, number one, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, that is from time immemorial, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Of course, that word isn't even in their vocabulary. They don't say creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Genesis 1. Let the dry land appear. Whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. Referring to the flood of Noah's time. But the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. If the scientists, if the biologists, if the geologists, and the paleontologists, and if the microbiologists, and a dynamic and historical geologist, and if all of the evolutionary sciences of the so-called physical sciences were to simply read the rocks, which cry out for them to see exactly what they say. Just read how those rocks got there. You pick up a rock and you say, of what is it composed? Well, it might be nice, not nice, N-I-C-E, but G-N-E-I-S-S. It might be kind of grayish, and it might have quartz and plagioclase feldspar, and maybe hornblende, and maybe mica, and it is called granite, except in some forms. And you know what basic pre-fossil bearing rocks are called, and they are supposedly bedrock. And in that layer are strata of rock, and it's not really a defined strata, but the bedrock on the very top of the mantle or the crust of the earth nearest those fossil bearing rocks, which are always sedimentary or at least metamorphic, and very few fossils are observable in metamorphosed rock. And you can see how they got there, how they were formed, how they were laid down, where they came from. You know, for example, at certain upthrusts, for example, out at Mount McKinley, you have ancient, ancient granite, non-fossil bearing, that is way above the fossil bearing strata in the Owens River Valley. Why? How? Well, it's simple. Simple. The crust erupted, it thrust, and the rocks that were down below were heaved up by a meeting of tectonic plates, by a crunching of the crust that came together. And, of course, now the older rocks are looming way up at 14,000 feet, where down in the valley are all of the sedimentary deposits that were there as a result of the flood. Here is Peter talking about the flood of Noah. Jesus Christ talked about the flood of Noah. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of Son of Man. Ezekiel said, though Job and Daniel and Noah were in it, no one would be saved except for his own righteousness, and talked about Noah. Noah is mentioned many places by many of the prophets and by Christ himself throughout the Bible. So the flood of Noah and Noah's ark, far from being a little children's Betty by tale, is actually the evidence that would warn man of a great cataclysmic disaster which exterminated the entire human race with the exception of eight people. And that another great extermination is coming, this time by fire, and the ark this time is not a ship made of wood, but is the spiritual body of Jesus Christ and spirit beings who are impervious to hundreds of degrees centigrade and who can walk around in the midst of a fire just like the angels did in the case of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you will turn to Genesis 6 and verse 1, let's read a little bit about this and think about some of the dimensions and some of the arguments against it, what some people have to say about the ark of Noah's time. Genesis 6, 1, It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. And by the way, using the model that the aged patriarchs, many of whom lived to be virtually 900 years of age and older, 
did not produce their first child until age 150. The book called The Genesis Flood by Whitcomb and Morris deduced there could be 1 billion, 100 million human beings on the earth, even if you said that the average family was six children, that seems to be a lot to you. Oh no, they had families much larger than that because it's proved in the Bible that the patriarchs, the ancient uh, fathers as they were called prior to Noah's time were still virile and they were still producing children when they were hundreds of years of age. And even as there were allowed during Abraham's day, wives and concubines, even as there were allowed during David's day, wives and concubines, and even as Jesus said, Jesus said, for the hardness of their heart that was allowed during that time, but it is not to be today that there was to be one man and one wife, there is no real proof, especially since they were a godless society with the exception of the one man that handed down from the one man to the next man who became the only man on the face of the earth that was really adhering to God's way of the ancient patriarchs. The others were all godless. So there's no proof whatsoever they didn't have multiple wives. And if multiple wives, then that model is inaccurate and there could have been far more people. But the model that we produced in my class at Ambassador College was that we said, what if we limited the average family, I think we said to only three children, I'd have to go back and get my computer and figure that out again, and they would not have their first child till age 25. And then those three would have three apiece, and those six would have three apiece, and on and on and on. You can see by the principle of the multiplication of a penny, doubling it every day for 30 days, or would you like a million dollars now? I think you end up with over five million dollars if you take the penny. So we figured out in my class that the earth could easily have had over four and a half billion human beings in one-sixth of all world's history to this time. But certainly the most conservative model I've ever seen is the one in Whitcomb and Morris. And they say one billion, one hundred million. How far could they have overspread the earth when you look at the conditions that were on the earth during that day in the pre-flood period? First of all, I can't belabor this because I'd be here for four hours. It is absolutely provable that in the permafrost and the tundra of Alaska and up in Siberia, where they have even been discovering very recently whole mammoths. You saw that on the news the other day, did you not? With the tusks and the entire body of the mammoth that was there. And maybe you knew and maybe you didn't that for many, many years, the people who were up in those areas of the world have actually fed mammoth meat to their sled dogs when they would find that a river or a thaw had actually unearthed one of the bodies. And for many years, clear up into the 1930s, one of the major sources of ivory for some of the piano keys on old upright pianos all over the United States came from the tusks of mammoths that were unearthed in Siberia and the Antarctic. So having said that, there is a baby mammoth in the Smithsonian in a freezer that you can actually go see through a piece of glass with greenery in its mouth, which was quick frozen while it was still masticating its food. So when the flood came, there was also the freezing of the polar ice caps that occurred. And many of these animals were preserved, and there could have been subsequent great storms which caused it as well. But the point is that they were animals of a tropical region and not animals which were equipped to su survive in sub-zero weather. So all of a sudden there came a quick freeze of these creatures in their tens of millions and the entire climatic pattern of the earth was changed. Now, why? Why did God do that? It said that it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair there is some intimation here that I am not going to elaborate upon. But first of all, let me remind you that when it says sons of God, Adam is also called the son of God in the genealogical tables in Matthew. And there were men who took the names of God, such as, for example, uh, Elijah. El, Eli, Yah, means God, he is God. And there's so many of them with an A-L on the end of it, like Michael, A-L. That's, of course, an angel's name, but a man's name as well. And men took the name of God, El, or Elohim, or Yah, or Jehovah, and took some of those portions of God's name and attached it to their own name. 
This is not saying that these were angels. Christ said, you do not know the power of God or anything about the resurrection because in a resurrection, when people come up, when he was asked that trick question by the Pharisees about whose wife would this man be when he'd been married to about seven different women, they are not marrying, they, they do not marry, nor are they given in marriage. Angels don't have DNA. Angels do not produce semen. Angels don't have fathers who produced it, who had fathers who produced it. Angels are spirit beings without all of the human organs that are necessary for survival of human life. Angels do not exist by the mastication and the digestion of food and the circular, circulatory system of a bloodstream. All right? They can manifest themselves as a human being and have done so. Look at the 19th chapter of Genesis. But Christ said, they do not marry, nor are they given in marriage, and I will stand with that. So the abominable doctrine that has caused a lot of white supremacists and others to try to hate, they don't try to hate, they do hate, the black race, and to claim that the Jews are not really the Jews, the people in Israel, but perhaps others are, and all kinds of twisted ideas, and the idea that allegedly Satan the devil himself had relations with Eve and produced Cain, who is, of course, all of these people that they want to get rid of today. It's an abominable, hateful doctrine. It's absolutely unbiblical. It is not true. I'm surprised that some people will look at this and not understand by a simple little bit of biblical research that this is not talking about angels cohabiting with women before the flood. It is not the origin of the Nephilim. It isn't where Neanderthal men or the Cro-Magnon men came from. But the intimation is interesting. The sons of God merely means men, masculine males, saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and took them wives of all which they chose. And the Eternal said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he, that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be in 120 years. And there's 120. Now, there was no lifespan that was suddenly, uh, by divine fiat, shortened to 120 years, because you can find that after that statement, Noah lived longer than that, and so did many others. But gradually it came down to about 75 years. This isn't talking about lifespan. It's talking about the days that man would continue to exist going the way of man, contrary to the way of God. They would be allowed a 120-year period. Ten times twelve. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also, after that, after the giants, also, after the fact that there were giants, or Nephilim, in the earth in that day, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Renown means renamed, or men of fame, or infamy. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Interesting sequitur, isn't it? Just follows right on with these marriages. Now, if you understand the truth, about Shem, Ham, and Japheth, you understand that Shem did not marry a Caucasian, Japheth did not marry an Oriental, and Ham did not marry a black woman, meaning that Shem, Ham, and Japheth were all, quote, white, end quote. What you need to understand is that the children of Adam and children from Adam right on down to the flood, and until the time of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and indeed until after the scattering abroad around the earth, if you read the Tables of Nations in the 10th chapter of the book of Matthew, at the time of the confusion of tongues, that there were families who were having children representing different color strains because every one of those three major racial strains were in the genes and chromosomes and the little eggs that were gradually to be uh, ovulated during the life of Mother Eve. It has been determined that when a little baby girl is born, in some microscopic way in the ovary, that every egg that she will ever have come to ovulation is in her body at birth. They are not formed later on. They are a part of the original child from the womb. So some geneticists have claimed. I can verily believe that, but even if that is not true, I know that the language concerning Cain, and then later on Abel, and then finally Seth. 
when it says that after Abel was slain, that Seth was born unto Adam and Eve and was in their image. When Eve says after Cain's birth, behold, I have gotten a man. That's all she says. But of Seth, the Bible says that they had a boy or a baby born in their image. I believe that Shem was, quote, Caucasian, end quote, or the Mediterranean so-called white, that Ham was black, and that Japheth was of the yellow races. I believe they are named after the fathers, not the mothers. And the Semitics and the Hamitics and the Japhetics bear the name of their eponymous ancestor, not the mother, but the father. I believe that's biblically correct. But God has not placed me here to try to preach about all the racial mixtures or uh, all that is going to be done in the millennium or all that has been done in the past whatsoever because God loves every single human being, whatever the color, and every human being that is born to whatever parentage God loves and is made in the image of, of God and has every opportunity for salvation like anyone else. So anyone who preaches racism from getting back into genetics and all of the time prior to the flood is to be condemned because that is not what it is all about. All right, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his hearts was only evil continually. And it repented the eternal that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him in his heart. And the eternal said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. And there could have been literally billions of them. The very smallest number would be about 1 billion, 100 million human beings by the, by the most generous model saying that a man didn't even have his first child till he was 140 years of age? That's got to be a very generous model. So imagine how many people you're talking about. The Eternal said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Eternal. What did Noah find? What is grace? Did Noah find indulgence? Did Noah find permission to live as the other people were? Did Noah find that God was gracious and that Noah could sin and live just like his neighbors, but that God was gracious? Or did Noah find both mercy and forgiveness because Noah might have been perfect in his generations, but was he perfect in the sense that Jesus Christ himself disclaimed and said, why callest thou me good? There is none good but God. And that while Noah was righteous, remember that it also called Job righteous before God, living according to the Ten Commandments, but he was not perfect in a spiritual sense, meaning that every thought, every deed, and every action that, Mo uh, that uh, Noah uh, ever committed in any manner, shape, or form during his entire life was absolutely perfect, or he would have been exactly as Jesus Christ, which he was not. Noah found grace. He found mercy and forgiveness in the eyes of the eternal. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. There is some intimation there that he was perfect in a way that other people were not. Now look at the context. It says that the men saw all of these fair women and married those whom they chose, not whom the parents chose, or the grandparents, or the patriarchs, or God, but whom they chose, whatever their druthers were. In the context, it continues on and says that Noah was perfect in his generations. I think that Noah married a woman that looked exactly like his type of the patriarchal lineage that had come down all the way from Seth. And that when Mrs. Noah, we don't know her name, had a child, the first one probably came out, looked just like them. And then came a black child. And then came a yellowish child with eyes that looked a little different. I believe that because I know that the origin of the races goes all the way back to Noah's sons and daughters on the ark. And that the uh, progenitors of the three major racial types on the entirety of this earth, all of mankind, were aboard that ark at Noah's time. There's just no doubt whatsoever in my mind. Noah begat three sons, Shem and Ham and Japheth. The earth was corrupt before God. Oh, and but before I go on, then who was the architect? Who was the creator and the designer of the black race? God Almighty. 
Who was the architect and the designer of the yellow races? God Almighty. God caused this. God intended it. He didn't just allow it. This was not something that was done contrary to God's will. God intended it. And therefore, all of the potential changes in, well, shadings of color and uh, physiognomy and height, shape, and weight, and we can see from the little pygmy in Ituri forest to a great eight-foot Nordic, maybe in Norway, and all the way to the gigantic blacks that are uh, playing our basketball games today, and it seems everybody is getting taller, and we're in a, a trend now where men are getting a lot taller than they used to be. Back when my father was a young man, the average height in the United States was under five foot seven for males during World War I. And if you go to the museums, like I've been to the Museum of Arms in London, and you will see the knights of those days of yore when these men wearing body armor were around, you'd be amazed. Most of them were much smaller than I am. And I'm smaller than the average. They were very, very tiny men, generally, during that day. Now we're in a time, I think, basically because of a combination of diet and a combination of uh, the absence of disease and, of course, hygiene, nutrition, that men are getting larger, that we're just getting bigger as a human race. So I wanted to say that before I go on. It said, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way, God's way, as well as their own way, upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shall thou make in the ark. Uh, some people think that was a kind of cypress, but it was a kind of uh, water-resistant wood. Rooms shall you make in the ark, and you shall pitch it within and without with pitch or with bitumen, like a heavy crude oil it was used. And this is the fashion which you shall make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. How much is a cubit? The common Hebrew cubit was 17.5 inches. If you have a pocket calculator, you can do what I did this morning. The longest cubit was 20.4 inches, the Hebrew cubit. The great cubit of Ezekiel was 25 inches, the one that is used in the dimensions of the temple. Using the smallest measurement, which is the cubit of 17.5 inches, this morning I figured it out, the ark then was 437.5 feet long. Now, my aircraft carrier was 888 feet long. It had 100 aircraft, 3,000 men aboard. It was uh, 150 feet wide and 60 feet above the ocean at the flight deck. The arc was 437.5 feet long, 72.92 feet wide, and 43.75 feet high, higher than a four-story building. That would be 145.83 yards or almost one and a half times the length of a modern football field. So if you went to a great bowl like the Rose Bowl and you saw this four foot high structure out there made of wood, one and a half times longer than the entire playing field, you get an idea of the size of the ark. But using the great cubit of Ezekiel, which I really think is the one that was used because that is God's cubit, not the Hebrew measurement, it would have been 625 feet long 104 and a half feet wide and 62 and a half feet wide, uh, high, or a six-story building. Now that's huge. Genesis 6:16 says that it had three decks and was finished above. So above the top deck, it also had a roof on it. Using the smallest measurement, it had a total deck area of 95,700 square feet. That's the equivalent of a little more than 20 standard college basketball courts. And that's a lot of room in a very big ship. In terms of cubic feet of storage space, the ark, the ark would have had about 13,960 tons. Now, any submarine commander in World War II that had an opportunity to sink a Japanese vessel up to 8,000 tons had really gotten him a gigantic prize. Normally, they were 4,500 to 5,000, and those are fairly large freighters. But an 8,000-foot ship would be something like a liner, a very large troop ship, or something very, very large, 8,000 tons. But the uh, 
ark would have weighed or displaced about 13,960 tons. And you know, it wasn't until 1884 that the Etruria, which was a Cunard White Star liner built in England, was larger than the ark. It was not until 1884, just a few years before my father was born, that man had ever built a ship that sailed the oceans larger than the ark of Noah's time. Now continuing in Genesis 6.16, A window shall you make to the ark, and in a cubit shall you finish it above, and the door of the ark shall be set on the side thereof, with lower, second, and third stories shall you make it. So there was a lower door, a hatchway for an entry. No doubt it was a very uh, perfectly fit. And by the way, the you can't believe that four men, even in that period of time, could have built that ark because you're looking at a structure that would have had beams about as, as huge as you could reach and would have had tremendous big logs to move. So animals would have been used and there would have been hirelings, there would have been wage earners. And as I portrayed many times in the past, there could have been a period of time that went on for literally decades when any number of laborers were building that ark and were living virtually in a shadow of it. It began to take shape out there, wherever it was, in a plain. He wouldn't have been building it on the slope of a mountain. He wouldn't have been on the top of a mountain. He would have been in a level place. And they would have had the chocks under it, would have laid the keel and put the ribs in place, just the way you build any kind of a ship. And little by little by little, it was taking shape. It took 120 years to complete quite a project. And during all of that time, Noah was preaching not only probably standing on a scaffold and shaking his fist at the people down there and saying, I'm tell you, telling you now, in 97 years, it's going to rain. What kind of a threat is that? <laughs> Most people couldn't have cared less. But finally it was, I'm telling you now, in two more years, it's going to rain. I'm telling you now, in another month, it's going to rain. They still didn't believe in the most unsuccessful evangelist in the history of evangelism. 120 years. He didn't just have a lifetime like Ezekiel or Isaiah, Jeremiah, or Herbert Armstrong, or anybody else. 120 years and not a single convert. Not even his wife. Not Shem or Ham or Japheth. Not a one of them believed this elderly old gentleman. He continued to shout and to preach about the coming kingdom of God and that a great destruction was going to come, and not a one of them believed him until it came time for, as the old Negro spiritual says, tell me Noah, didn't it rain? <laughs> There's a great song that, that I used to sing when I was in, in uh, high school. Tell me Noah, didn't it rain? 40 days, 40 nights. And then there's one about the old ark, a mover and a mover, and the old ark's a mover and on about how the waters bore it up. Just great music. Then they were screaming and yelling, and of course mounting a fast horse and headed for the highest hill they could find. But it was to no avail. I won't read all of this, but uh, let's go to the part, let me see about the food that is eaten. Verse, uh, what about 19 or so? Take unto thee of all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to thee, and it shall be food for thee and for them, which proves that prior to the flood, all of these creatures, including the great cats, of which there would have been only one pair, we're talking about a Genesis kind, not all of the many, many species that have gradually evolved. Yes, I can use that term because microevolution is absolutely true. Macroevolution is not. One kind does not become another kind. A horse doesn't become a cow, but there are hundreds and hundreds of varieties of horses and hundreds of varieties of cows. And in, within that Genesis kind, there are all kinds of species and subspecies, as well as mutations and sometimes sele uh, selective breeding interference by man. Thus did Noah, all that God commanded him, so did he. What's a, that's a great statement, isn't it? Just like Abraham, he commanded him to go, so Abraham departed. The Eternal said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast you shall take to thee by sevens. Some people have misunderstood this. I had a letter the other day where a lady thought it meant only seven of them. Couldn't figure that out. It says the male and his female. So obviously means seven pair. And of beasts that are not clean, camels, lions, etc. The male by two, the male and his female. Of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of the earth. Even ravens who could have been on some floating 
mass of vegetation and perhaps survive? No, I doubt it, because the storms would have been so severe, we can talk about that briefly, if I have time, which I doubt, uh, that you have to understand just what an incredible event this was. Uh, for example, it says a little later on, they went two by two, and then it came to pass in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day, were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. The atmosphere of the earth prior to that time was more like a Venusian atmosphere. The atmosphere contained tremendous amounts of vapor. It was like a greenhouse effect. It rained daily, but there was filtered sunshine as well. And the entire earth was basically tropical. The earth was moved out of its orbital or the tilt so that magnetic north and true north are different. The polar ice caps were formed, and of course, the mountains were formed beneath the oceans, and you cannot suspend either winds and the effect on waves or the orbital pattern of the earth or the magnetic field of the moon while all of those waves were ravaging the earth. And they only had to be about 22 and a half feet above the top of the tallest mountain on the earth at that time, which was Ararat. At that time, meaning before the flood. By the end of the flood, here came booming up out of the pushing of the huge tectonic plates, and they were all shoved toward the west. Get a map of the Rocky Mountains, starting the Aleutians, up at Kiska now too, and come right on down through Alaska, and right through the great Rocky Mountains, and right through the mountains in Southern California, and right on down through Mexico, where all the volcanoes are, and right on down through Central America with the volcanoes in Honduras and Nicaragua, and right on down to the lesser and the greater Andes, and there is Aconcagua soaring 22,000 feet above the uh, ocean level in the nation of Chile. But those mountains could have been formed while the flood waters prevailed upon the earth. And by the time Noah's Ark settled upon the top of Ararat, which is barely over 17,000 feet, there could have been other mountains which were looming large all over the earth that were being formed because during the flood, the tectonic plates were actually separated. The earth was at one time shrunk a little bit upon the floating magma beneath so that the waters completely covered the earth, that is the breaking up of the fountains at a great deep, and then raining, torrential rain, for 40 days and 40 nights. There have been a lot of objections because people have tried to say, well, at absolute saturation, the atmosphere can only hold X amount of water and they take today, and they try to measure it on models depending upon today, instead of a different atmosphere, which would have accounted for several things. One, the tremendous lifespan of man and animals. Two, the nature of animals so that they were herbivores and not carnivores. And three, the facts from geology and from historical geology and from archeology span and biology of the life forms that dwelt in different areas of the earth long prior to the flood that are no longer dwelling there today, that are found only in fossil life. So, reading a little later on, it said that they went into Noah in the ark, two and two of all flesh were in his breath of life. Oh, and I wanted to comment in passing, notice that clean and unclean is way before there was ever anybody called Jew or Judah, way before Levi way before the clean and unclean commands that were given through Moses at the foot of Mount Sinai. This has nothing to do with ceremony. A pig is a pig is a pig, and it's not fit to eat. And a camel is not fit to eat, and skunks and roadkill aren't fit to eat, in spite of the menu that I saw down a little restaurant here at the other side of, of uh, Frankston in Texas. I don't think they really serve it, but they had the menu on the wall. And, uh, you know, possum, skunk, all kinds of stuff was there. And it was really funny to read it. But some people eat that stuff. They really do. And, of course, they eat rats and they eat cats and they eat dogs. And in Los Angeles, there's been a tremendous attrition because of the very large numbers of Vietnamese, Laotians, Chinese, and others that have come into Los Angeles so that right as of the beginning of 2000, the whites are going to be a minority in Los Angeles and all of the others, a huge Chicano community and a huge Oriental community from many different nations are going to be in the majority. And because people, you know, keep little, little pooch on a leash now and then and little tabby better stay indoors because they just disappear. Nobody knows where they went. So they put out in the Korean community a brand new cookbook, it said down there. It had a different spelling, but it was called How to Walk Your Dog. And uh, I'm just kidding. I, I'm just kidding. But uh, they, they might have put out that kind of a, a cookbook. So they're not clean. Notice that clean and unclean way, way antedates the time of the ceremonial laws, the time of Moses. 
There is a tremendous amount of information in that book I wish you would read that is called The Genesis Flood by Whitcomb and Morris. So those of you that have access to a computer, you can simply get into Amazon.com and ask them to get you a copy of that. And I would advise you to read it about four or five times. I taught from it for years in Ambassador College because it is a wonderful text. It goes through all the arguments against the flood, all of those that wrote extensively about a local flood, why that can't be, arguments from uniformitarianism and geologists and evolutionists and so on, and it's just a fantastic testimony about the great flood of Noah's time. Orogeny did take place. We know that. We can read the mountains by looking at them. We know that mountains have been formed, and some of them have been formed in comparatively recent times. We all know that St. Helens did blow its stack, and we know that it took completely changed the top of the mountain. We know that it buried all of those cities, including I have a mug that was made out of the ash that fell on somebody's front yard. And now, from some of the satellites, are putting geophysical satellites in a stationary uh, position above the Earth and looking at temperatures and even at land masses and trying to get a handle on whether or not there really is such a thing as global warming, warming which there is to a small extent. And uh, they're seeing that in the area up around Mount St. Helens, gradually, uh, nature is uh, making a recovery. That there are bushes and shrubs and grasses and long, young little trees beginning to come back and to spring up through some of that ash after all of these years. For five solid months, the waters prevailed 150 days. And remember that if they prevailed up to 22 and a half feet above the top of the tallest mountain in the Middle East at that time, which today is 17,000 some odd hundred feet. The Earth's radius, looking at it as the radius, not the circumference now, is about 3,959 miles. So 3,959 miles is the radius of the Earth. The outer crust is 20 to 25 miles thick and varies. In thousands of places, the crust of the Earth is pierced by the flowing molten rock called magma that is beneath. Can you think of any places where that is true? Well, of course, all the thousands of volcanoes immediately. What about Yellowstone? Immediately, yeah, hot springs, of course. It's down there, isn't it? Not very far either. Uh, I don't think they ever made any progress with trying to get to one of the places in the ocean where the mantle is supposed to be very thick and then trying to drill down because they'd have to drill down literally for about 20 miles and man simply does not have that technology. But they were trying to do, to, to do that because we know less about this earth and its interior than we do about the uh, surface of Mars. And we know less about some of the life forms on this earth in the depths of the oceans than we do about astronomy, for that matter. The core has a radius of about 2,160 miles and is thought to be molten iron mixed with nickel, which accounts for the magnetic poles of the earth and has a temperature, allegedly, they think, of about 2,500 degrees centigrade to the second power. That's hot. That's why some people have speculated that's where hell is. Well, it isn't, but when hell comes up to meet the surface, it might be. The mantle is about 1,800 miles thick. The crust is above the mantle. The mantle is 1,800 miles. You go on down, there's another 2,160 miles to the center of the earth, the core of the earth, and that's our earth, Eretz, that we live upon. Now, all of the topography, the location of continents, the distribution of oceans, the type of climate was completely different, including the temperature, prior to the flood than subsequent to the flood. As I said, you can't suspend the forces provided by the rotation of the earth, the gravitational pull of the moon, the fantastic winds. It says that a great wind dried up the earth afterward. If you want to go and find huge deposits of LUSS, L-O-E-S-S, -S, in the great Gobi Desert, if you want to look at Great Sand Dunes National Monument, they can't find out where, where it came from. I know exactly where it came from. You can stand in the San Luis Valley, look at the huge big deposits where they've made many, many desert movies in Colorado up by Alamosa. If you go north of that just a little bit below Blanca Peak, which is in the Sangre de Cristo range, you will see those fabulous sand dunes. Where do they come from? Kansas, eastern Colorado, and all of the central part of the United States. Because you can look and there is a gap in those mountains just like a gun sight. And what happens when a violent wind blows from east to west and scours the earth, getting these grains of sand and dirt, and just carrying the heavier grains across and over the mountains. Well, it burbles down like this, doesn't it? 
and just falls like lake effect snow on Buffalo. And that's exactly where it came from. You can read it. It's just like a book waiting to be read. You can read cuts in the roadway between LA and Bakersfield. You can read the Grand Canyon. You can read the rocks. You can read Mount Whitney with a little volcanic cone out of its side. And you know the volcanic cone came after the upthrust of huge granitic blocks of rock. And you know that the granite is older than some of the, uh, the deposits of sedimentary rock down in the Owens River Valley. So we need to, to pay attention to what this earth is telling us because Peter says that it is actually testimony to what is going to take place in the future and the, the time of judgment against all of God's, uh, all of the people here on this earth whom God is going to judge. Look at 2 Peter 2, 4 to 9. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to Tartaru, it's, it's hell in the English, but it's the only word in the entirety of the New Testament where, where the time, where, the only time in the New Testament where the word Tartaru appears is here. And it means a place or condition of restraint. Not a burning place, but a place of restraint. And delivered them unto chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Now those are the angels that followed Satan and his rebellion. You read of in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those who should after live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation or conduct as it should read to the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knows, if he did all of that, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. Just as the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the earth's tectonic plates were shrunk so that the oceans overflowed the surface as well as the rain coming down for 40 days and 40 nights. And just as that huge flood floated that ark up to the top of Ararat, and some characters that I really think are idiots who talk about a local flood and still acknowledge that the ark may be on Ararat, and many people say it's been found. There have been any number of books and articles, pictures, people have brought back pieces of wood, they've subjected it to radiocarbon dating and claim that it's exactly the right age that it ought to be. And because of governmental difficulties and because of the tremendous snows and a bad weather, 17,000 some odd hundred feet up there, higher than, than uh, Mount uh, what? Uh, out in, not McKinley, McKinley maybe a tiny bit higher than that, but one of the tallest mountains in the world, among the tallest mountains in the world. And so they have not been able to unearth the entirety of the ark, but there are many people who claim that they've actually found it. Can you imagine a person claiming it was a local flood and acknowledging that the flood waters got to be 17,000 feet deep? That's local? 17,000 feet? to be 22 feet above 17,000 feet, and that's local? How far is that water going to flow? Water seeks its own level. That's not local, that's global. If we heard that a flood of 17,500 feet were taking place in the great Gobi Desert, we're knowing, but we're gonna die unless God saves us because it's going to affect the entirety of the earth. That water's gotta go somewhere. Well, when I was reading that book last couple of days and thinking about all of this, I wanted to talk about it again because the rocks themselves cry out and show as a witness that God Almighty formed and shaped this earth, that it was reformed and reshaped at the time of Adam, that it was reformed and reshaped again at the time of Noah, and it's going to be reformed and reshaped again at the time of God's judgment when there will not be any more sea, there will not be any more green trees, only the elements of the earth, maybe gold and all of the precious stones will be visible and it will be God's headquarters of the entirety of the universe for the rest of God's plan. And that is truly the very beginning because he said, behold, I make all things new in the 22nd chapter of the book of Revelation. Well, I was fiddling around with it a little bit this morning and I thought I'd really, I'd just like to write a little poem to leave with you that I'll call the rocks cry out. Look at me, the Grand Canyon said. Study the size of my riverbed and gaze upon the thick layers of my rock and join, if you dare, those who mock at the flood of Noah's time 
and the great one before that, and say that the Colorado River did all this, and so became another uniformitarianist. One who denies the God who made him, who scoffs and sneers at all his ultimatums. One who says we came from an amoeba, an evolutionist, a doubter, a true believer. All things continue like they did before, he claims. No great flood carved out these canyons or formed all those plains. It all happened because of gradual erosion. It was only the rain and the wind and the times that the land was frozen, while the huge glaciers were slowly moving and the great ice ages were proving that evolution is true and there is no God, that we all came from green slime or brown scum and not from the sod. But one day in the not too distant time, when the sun turns black and the moon doesn't shine, and the earth begins to groan and rumble, and the rocks beneath your feet shake and tumble, you will cry out in anguish and a terrible fear, and ask, is there a safe cave anywhere near here? For there will be the time, that time of the angels shout, when nowhere on the earth will anyone any more doubt, when they will turn to the very rocks they ignored and say, hide us from him on the white horse with that terrible sword. And then, in that time not so far ahead, there will not be a single doubter, living or dead. No more time to argue, cajole, and theorize, but up close and personal. When all men will realize that the God who made the rocks and shaped the earth's crust is the Lord Jesus Christ, who's returned for His just. He'll stand in that day on some rocks of His own, the Mount of Olives, the place of His throne, which He will split right down the center and divide into two, and establish His kingdom there for me and for you. Surely the rocks do cry out, and we need only to listen to what they say, to watch and to listen and to always pray and remember that Jesus said, we would be living in a time just like Noah's day.